So I thought uh, it would be a good idea to go back and, and find some case studies to maybe talk to you about some of the, the things I've seen and, and that you can find on the internet as well as if I think of something that uh, I know about a particular case or, or um, observations I have I can share with you. So, uh, I want to tell you that a lot of the sources I'm finding are actually out on the web, and I'll try to tell you how to find them. And uh, when I ever get an account here, I'll publish them so you can see them yourself. Uh, what I want to talk about today, uh, I know a little bit about, because it did involve Lockheed at one point in time, and, and uh, it's called the FBI case file. And uh, it's a fiasco. So I thought, you know, you learn a lot by seeing what doesn't work. And, and just, just the lessons learned. Um, and if you think about what the the the, the study is here, the, the problem they were tackling was a pretty complicated problem. Uh, it's kind of a conventional approach to systems engineering that they should have done. Uh, and then at the end, I want to tie back into the transcending paradigms because I think there's something a lesson learned from from Lockheed and, and actually uh, the FBI relative to this that's now changed how they're approaching these kinds of problems. So some background. Now, this is about the FBI. So they have 23 divisions. You hear about what they do. Um, they talk to a lot of people. It's all access control. Um, they collaborate with law, local law enforcement. And they have to document every step of the way. Okay? Uh, and they have to use these to build their cases. And uh, the system that they developed came from the 20s, when they were first, first there, and they standardized to nice forms. In 2000, they had hundreds of standardized forms in paper and antiquated IT systems, which may be familiar to some of us. Mm -hmm. 13,000 computers that could not run modern software. The offices were connected by their own internet, which could communicate up to 56 kb <laughs> telephone. Nice. Uh, they could not email U.S. attorneys, federal agencies, law enforcement, each other, so they faxed everything. This is 2000. Uh, after the 9-11 Commission report, they said the FBI's information systems were woefully inadequate. The FBI lacked the ability to know what it knew there was no effective mechanism for capturing or sharing the institutional knowledge. So it was, a, it was apparent in 2000 that this was not something they could live with. So they came out with a program called the Trilogy Program. They authorized $380 million for it, and it was to modernize the FBI information sharing. It had three parts. We're going to get the 56 field offices together with updated computer terminals, scanners, printer services. Service. They're going to re-implement the FBI internet for secure local area networks, and they're going to replace the FBI's investigative software apps, which were probably just um, digitized versions of their forms, I'm guessing, at the time, with an automated case support system, ACS. So that's 2000, and they have a wonderful time. June 2001, they award a contract to SAIC, and to build this. And the, the purpose was to find information in their database without prior knowledge that it's there, uh, to search with a single query using multiple search engines, improve the capability to share it within and outside the FBI, provide access to authorized information, and allow the evaluation of cases and crime patterns through the use of tools. So a pretty good high level provision they have. 2001 June. September 11th hit. The inability of the FBI to share information was very well known at that time. And it got on steroids after September 11th. It became interest of Congress to help and change it quickly. So all of a sudden you have a brand new director of the FBI. He has this 
brand new, let's modernize, and September 11th hits, and one of the biggest complaints is nobody's sharing information. So you can imagine the amount of pressure that they get to, to take a look at. So in January 2002, they, they approved another $78 million. Okay, now, so what they were planning to do was basically just web enable their existing applications. They said, okay, you know, whatever that thing is, we're just going to make you able to pull it up on a browser. And maybe we'll have some sort of search engine behind that. I don't think we even had Google back then. I think Yahoo was the big one. Right? And so in 2001, December, FBI asked SAC to stop. You know, you've only been doing it three, four months, six months, whatever. We don't want you to do this. We want you to instead build this virtual case file, BCF. It's going to be a totally new different application, database, graphical user interface. Uh, it's going to make our criminal and terrorist investigative information readily accessible to everyone. And it will have standardized processes. But, as they went on, Funding wasn't a problem. You know, after scenario 11, money flowed, process changed, you get all kinds of interesting legislation coming about. Um, so in 2002, SIC committed they're going to do this entirely new case management system in 22 months. The scheduling was focused on what was desired, not what was possible. Okay. And their scope grew by about 80% from their initial baseline. So, give them a little more money, still millions of dollars, shorten schedule, and all of a sudden it's a whole new scope. Some of the reasons for failure that are cited in the case study is that they're associated with them either not using or misuse of numerous systems engineering practices, especially with stakeholder <coughs> requirements, decomposition, planning, assessment, control, and risk. So that's sort of a summary statement for this. Uh, with the political pressures, scheduling was accelerated to the point where it's nearly impossible for developers to even determine what the appropriate system of funds were. So it got worse. The FBI also cycled through five different chief information officers in four years. Uh, FBI decided there's no time to develop formal requirements and validate them with the user community. Uh, and, and one of the key summaries is it was a case where they were not getting the requirements sufficiently defined to even rationally determine what should be done. They continually redefined requirements such that when they first uh, started to have any demonstrable software, they had 400 changes in the first year. They got worse. Um, when they started to get something out, they discovered, well, the network that they had was not going to support this kind of new, new issue. So since they had a requirement set, nobody had really been looking at the, the network that was going to have to live on. So they started doing their best guesses of what they need to do to get the, the network up to speed. Uh, reaction to the time pressure, SAC decided to break the development group into eight teams working in parallel on different functional elements of the program, but they didn't work the integration out, so they could never integrate correctly. By the time it was finally canceled, uh, I should have the year here, but I don't, uh, they had over 700,000 lines of custom code written for an incomplete set of requirements in an 800 page volume. The Office of Inspector General cited, you know, various reasons, but it's poorly defined, involving design requirements, contracting weaknesses, IT weaknesses, lack of an enterprise architecture, you've heard me talk about what that is, lack of management continuity and oversight, unrealistic scheduling of tasks, lack of adequate project integration, Resolution of issues. And so uh, I hadn't really been following this until they canceled it. And they said, well, they're going to do another program called Sensible. 
in 2005. It's going to fix it. So the same FBI director, Miller, said we're going to have a four-phase, four-year project to fulfill the purpose of VCF and provide this web-based case and records management system. Um, in the five years that they did, it was going to be based upon commercial software. They're going to build it. And uh, when they finally implemented it, it came about uh, under budget. Still spent another four, another $450 million. And it also took, took two and a half years over due. But the rest of the story is, uh, even when they did that, um, they to really get to closure, they brought in somebody from totally outside. Okay, so they SAS he had won the original one, older than the pressure, they give it to Lockheed, rebranded as Sentinel, still wasn't getting there where as fast as they wanted to. So they brought in somebody from pure commercial industry and uh, basically pushed Lockheed to a back burner kind of you know support and this guy would help oversee it. Uh, they continued with the commercial side of things, and uh, when I was first heard about this, that was when I was starting to hear the phrase, adopt, buy, create. You know, let's not go create something brand new. Let's uh, adopt something that exists on the shelf. Let's go buy it. So it became a mantra. And so the paradigm was starting to shift there a little bit from writing a million lines of code, which we were certainly doing on many other programs, to what can we do to integrate things that are there and manage them. But the big paradigm shift, I think, was the agile development. If, you, if you've looked at software development, I don't know if you've been to any of that, it's basically where you say, have a set of requirements uh, in a sprint, we're gonna agree to those with the stakeholder, we're gonna do so many of these pieces of, of um, development, at the end we'll have a test and validate with the customer that we're there. So it became this agile uh, approach. Um, <coughs> Also, don't deploy new software and old hardware. Uh, turns out that the uh, person they brought in was later hired by Lockheed. Uh, so they learned how to, uh, to adapt with, uh, with the times. And uh, uh, they then became, uh, they came on and took uh, some of the things they were doing to the next generation identification system, which is a biometric kind of thing. So, the, the, the point of this was I wanted to come back to this, this V that I've been talking about. So a lot, of, a lot of things we talk about are requirements and validating, but it's really a process. It's really the methodology. It does take time. It needs to be scalable to whatever system you're going to attack, right? Uh, in this case, what broke down for the VCF? Requirements definition. They just didn't have them. And it also changed, right? You know, they were off saying, okay, this is just normal. We're going to update this old system with something, and what can we afford and with whatever the state of the art was at the time. Uh, and then and everybody's thrown asunder with 9 11. Okay. Rush to go fix it differently. You know, we've got an existing contract. How do we modify it? Uh, don't have time to wait, you know. And so, how many times? If any of you got into something and say, well, we don't have time to plan it out. We, we just got to get going, right? And, and that's one of the big issues with systems engineering. A lot of times, uh, stakeholders don't want to do this. So say, you know what? We know what the fix is. Let's just go do it. And we'll keep doing what we've always done. And so that's one of the things that you're going to have to take when you go back home is how do we show the value of this until they've lived it? And so that's one of the challenges we'll have to do together is, is say as we implement, whether we're talking about you know, flow, disruption, variability, we're also going to talk, have to talk to them about this whole different governance. And so what I'm doing is I'm pointing out where there's weaknesses, we have failures that I believe are, have root causes in systems engineering weaknesses as we do pilots and the governance, as we apply these things here, we're going to have to start to convince people that this is valuable and something we ought to be doing as standard in what we do. It has to be scalable. Uh, there are many different sources for details on that. Um, and 
mean, they're all really more of um, a logical process flow of how do you go have discussions with stakeholders, how do you determine performance requirements, how do you decompose them. Um, where I think you guys will be able to help uh, is not just with the overall process, but when they start to design new systems. Because I think when they do new systems, um, they do look at overall requirements that they're trying to satisfy, but I'm not sure they look at it from the standpoint you're learning here. I think they'll say, okay, I have to do this particular objective, here's a performance requirement, but I'm not sure they're looking at the optimization, the modeling and system uh, uh, simulation that you're learning here. And I think that's a key part of systems engineering that you can bring into these new projects that you have. So the challenge I think though is, you know, this is fine when you have something brand new. You know, I'm gonna go build a new satellite, I'm gonna build a new missile, but we have existing systems today that we have to go deal with. And we have to, we're looking at things where we can incrementally improve it. If we're going to go help wholesale improve it, then it's going to be a, needs a different methodology. So imagine if you were in, in, in SAIC or Lockheed and you were handed this and you have those kinds of pressures on you. How would you approach it differently so it didn't have the same result? I mean, they count Sentinel as success now, but they, they spent, what, almost a billion dollars on this? And I would bet that it's still probably not where they would like it to be, to be honest. Yeah? I like how Sentinel broke it into phases. So perhaps instead of with the, with the original one, when they had the pressure to complete it faster, they could have just said, uh, we're just, we will complete the max or the most important requirements in phase one faster, and then that would still meet everybody's, it would meet the pressure from the political pressure, and then also it wouldn't, it wouldn't have accelerated the project to the point of not being able to get it done. I think you're right. I think that was a part about the agile development as well. This, uh, this, you know, we have this grand vision here, let's break it off in the chunks and make sure that we can do this and get the customer involved. In fact, that's been, the, I think, one of the, the, the key pieces of agile development is you have the customer involved all along the way. So you start off with wonderful ideas and I can do this and I can do that. Reality sets in when you start to do these and it comes out. You can immediately show the customer, say, okay, here's what we learned, here's what we did. You know, it's, it's going to have to change because of, you know, uh, something we thought was unobtainable is not, you know, or, or at a long way. That ability to adapt uh, with the customer is crucial, I think, in some of these systems. And if you have this governance process where you're going to require, you're going to manage the baselines of requirements, you have a, a very well structured way to to tackle if a requirement changes why, and then all the different intricacies are are covered. Uh, so, you know, I can just imagine, I wasn't involved in any of these, but I can just imagine the teams speaking to certain parts of that BI, not even the all 50 some odd offices or a representative of them. And, and one of the biggest things wasn't even just with respect to just the FBI, it was interagency sharing. So I was definitely on some of those briefings afterwards, and I can tell you, this group knew something, this group knew something, this group knew something, they had it there. They couldn't find it themselves. If they could, they weren't able to share. Okay, and so it's really a a cross intelligence community issue in in terms of what we saw in 9/11. So they created all kinds of other things to try to break the paradigms. There was a, a counterterrorism task force that was stood up. It was a multi agency thing where they would their their goal was to share information no matter what and. Um, that uh, those kinds of paradigms are what we have to do more frequently, I think, rather than waiting for another one. Okay. I'm going to try and bring in a few examples of these. Of uh, this system here uh, uh, is 
what's sort of thought of as a as high complex and there are a lot of pressure. There's a few other examples I found that are, are like the V2 bomber and F111. I mean, there's some really significant um, things I want to bring in and talk to you from time to time. Uh, I'm going to bring in a smart bus implementation from Chattanooga. There's, there's, there's a use of system engineers uh, around uh, some science activities. So I want to show you how the process here can be applied in, in quite different kinds of systems because it really is tailoring. I mean, it, it's an outline, but you're going to have to structure it to whatever your, your particular system is. I mean, you don't want to do this from the dry pipe in, in the kind of uh, system that uh, they took on. But you want to look at the architecture and, and make sure you cover all the pieces. Right? Okay, I have a short talk today. I want to go over this and talk through any questions you had about it. They want to talk to you about a potential project, well, a project that I'm trying to get set. And you're going to need a, a couple of students to, to help with. But before I go to that, I want to talk to you. If you have any questions on this one. Do you think they did any of these things you talked about up here? They're just coming together. That's what they're doing. They're writing it from scratch. If you write 700,000 lines of code, you're writing it from scratch. I guarantee you. And then when they got into the, the, the gluing pots together, that was never intended to be put together, you're writing glue code. And uh, I have seen examples of where that's good and where that's not so good. Whole other set of problems. And we're not talking to customers, so we're not going through the requirements and stuff. All right, I want to talk to you a little bit about documented safety analysis. People familiar with the DSA, that sort of thing, I bet, right? Okay, so uh, a pilot project I'm trying to get started is uh, leveraging the fact that we have two sites coming together and we're trying to get our, our safety basis uh, 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 procedures and, and approaches consolidated between the sites. So there's already an activity looking at how do we get to a combined way that we build a TSR and these other, other things. So it's my intent to try a pilot with support from the experts and the customer to look at not only how do we do it today, but how do we do it differently. Okay, I want to take it beyond just how do the procedures come together such that Pantex and Y12 agree that that's okay. okay. And what I've seen so far at Y12 and Pantex is we have a huge number of documents, a very few flow diagrams, as you're talking about here today. Um, so one of the first things we're going to do is we're going to try and map out the as-is of the process for the different piece parts of both, both sites. Okay. And I can tell you today, when we talk about throughput and variance and complexity, uh, today, um, there's concerns about this. Uh, people are very concerned about how fast things come through, what's the quality of them, is there pressure for, for the people doing this. Uh, and so I think it's a wonderful opportunity to look at these from the standpoints of the flow, the variation, disruption part of this. So I want to start the document as is for both of these. want to look at it from that standpoint. I want to look at it and say, okay, what are the main piece parts that go between them? A lot of this is uh, satisfying requirements. So we're thinking about looking at a, a, a tool for managing the database of requirements. We're thinking about um, looking at the modeling and SIM tools that they need for the analysis and ways that these need to interact and do configuration management on so you don't have to recreate every time. We're also thinking about what can we do to help automate report generation, okay? 
Uh, today, what we have, uh, I'll just I'll pick on Pantex because you're not here. I'll, I'll pick on my problem. Yeah. Uh, it is kind of a pressure cook. We have engineers in there, and, and they're writing documents, and, uh, and, and everybody wants more out yesterday. And we engineers, we're not necessarily the best writers, to be honest. You know? And a lot of the work seems to be administrative. And so um, there's that whole issue. You know, are you getting a quality document out? Um, so we want to look at ways to, to have sort of a living breathing safety basis with requirements that can be analyzed across any of your documents, any updates, who's affected, and what can we do tool-wise to help automate generation of reports, okay? Maybe it's a dictation software, maybe it's expert-based systems. So, so this is what we have in our head going into this, but we have to start here, okay? So um, I, I have to whip I think I have to win approval for this. Uh, I have initial um, uh, 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 interest, but that'll be happening in the next two to three weeks. Uh, I'll be looking for at least one student here and at least one student at Pantex, or maybe we can work something to uh, help that. Uh, last time uh, we did, did one of these, uh, we were able to cover part of the people on burden but it had to be an agreement between all the organizations involved. This time it may be that. Uh, we do have a, uh, the potential of one of, our, one of our direct funding uh, sources here, so we're gonna have to explore that. But I want to share this out for you, with you now so you can start thinking about it. If you want to participate, uh, uh, you send me a note and we'll start to talk. Um, another one we're thinking about, I haven't gotten quite as far along yet, but uh, I intend to, is uh, a PDRD project. Um, what we have today in development is we have some really smart scientists and engineers, and they develop key technologies. And they try to have good interaction with the stakeholders, say, where's this going in the plant? But quite frankly, there's there's a there's a little bit of a, there's a little bit of a discontinuity between development, project engineering, and operations. And it's a, it's it's natural. You hear it all over the place. You, if you're in the DoD world, it's called the Valley of Death. You develop something, and then you can never get it transitioned. So what we want to look at is a system engineering uh, activity to look at scalable practices apply to key technologies and see if we can pilot what would be the right scale to do for a TRL4, TRL5 kind of project. How do we slowly upgrade that? How do we have those discussions with the, the key clients over here that need it down the road to make sure we have requirements satisfied and understood? How do we make sure we understand operations requirements? Where is it going to go? How is that understood? So that we're not developing something that we already know is never going to work, even if they, even if they find a wonderful discovery, if they can't fit into the plan for whatever the plans are, it doesn't help us. So we want to pilot a, a practice of using system engineering for a lower TRL project, and then transition that up the chain all the way into operation. So that's sort of the premise of the PDRD project. As that one gets involved, I'd like to get some students involved with that as well. Um, and uh, I have admit, again, I have initial interest, so so that's another opportunity. Um, other things we're working on is uh, we're going to write a, a SIMP, a Systems Engineering Management Plan, and, it, and this is basically the governance that we've been talking about melded into our processes within engineering. Say, okay? so we're going to have to look at existing procedures, conduct of operations. How do we do CM? How do we do all these kinds of things? How do you fold this into the procedures at both plants? So uh, I'm interested in anybody who wants to help with that because I really need some subject matter experts that are starting to understand systems engineering that we can write a governance document that helps. So those are the things I've got coming up for this year, FY17. Again, if you're interested in any of those three, just drop me up. Okay. Other questions?
I uh, would love to see some of the techniques you learned last last course. I hear you talk about who's refreshing your memory. I'd love to see some of those applied to some of those here. Okay? Because I can see right now it'll be very straightforward for us to get a Kaizen event, we draw this out, we get an agreement on it, we get this done. And, that, and that's work. That, getting that done is work. And we'll get to some agreement. And I can see us jumping into this. You know, hey, this is the better way, you know, what's should be, et cetera, et cetera. We'll get your IT system up to modern. But I think we're missing a key opportunity if we don't start analyzing some of the as-is processes based upon what you learned last course. So that when we get here, we can see how we're doing better. Do we have a goal? What's the requirement? Yeah. I have a question. Do you have, um, any information I don't have that. Yes, I don't. Uh, where, where I would approach that question is I would look at how many people we have there. You know? And I could tell you, I think it's a lot more at uh, Pantex than I thought. Um, and a lot of that has to do with you know, how do we classify you know, safety class systems um, and, and how do we generate them. So I, I don't have an answer. I can tell you how the procedures and documents are implemented. The two sites are quite different, and that's one of the challenges we have. Uh, and um, I can tell you from what I understand, again, I'm just learning from other people, that how they've reacted to quality improvements here has only increased the pressure and the pressure for them. Um, there was a few years back when they were challenged on the quality of their output. And uh, from what I understand, the, the solutions, instead of looking at the things you're learning here, was okay, well, if, if we have writers not writing very well, we're gonna get all the managers to rewrite things. <laughs> so what you end up doing is, you get people that, it takes them two years to get qualified to even write the darn thing, they can sign off on it. And, and of course, if there's any, what happens when something is unexpected is found in this area? You stop operations, and they're not happy, and they say, how fast can you get this thing through? They're, they're pull, push, whatever you want to call it, it's immediate, right? So, talk about a pressure cooker, right? So, and what do you think happens when you submit a document and then somebody on the other team is, uh, is uh, an expert as well and some of the things are very, can get subjective, you know, saying, I don't know that you did enough. So, so it's back to, well, how well did you model assimilate it? How well did you express it in the documents that somebody can pick it up and understand it? I mean, the products here are documents, right? That then drive other procedures. So, so it's a highly people intensive, built on old IT software, uh, very flexible software, and lots and lots of people to approve things, okay? So, so we're looking at ways to not only combine the procedures, because we're now one, one company and we want to do it better, we, we want to give a totally different paradigm. And so you can imagine one vision, one goal of this is instead of saying, oh, I'm gonna do the annual I got to do an annual update. That's one of the requirements by regulation, right? It's continuous. Anytime you need it, there's a new requirement put in there, since this process is set. I mean, you can think of that kind of a reality if we can do it correctly. Now, what I'm a little worried about, I'll tell you this, is, you know, this is the way we've always done it. This is the way we've always done it. The people who, who not left us because of the pressure cooker, We've been doing it so long that uh, we've got a little bit of that. Okay. This is the Pantex way. This is the Watch Bob way. We're going to have those coming up. Okay, they're already happy. This is totally new. So there's going to be challenges here, but that's what I think Dr. Sonny was saying when he says, you know, you've got to be aggressive and get people to change. Okay. So, so does Pantex kind of handle things like the SAR PSR the same way we do with, with DCNs? The multiple revisions. 
multiple revisions. Right. Uh, I, I bet they don't handle it the same way. Well, I mean, do they, they kind of approach it like that DCM thing, which, which I, I find confusing. Right, I don't right. Well, they also have like a one massive TSR. Right. <laughs> so, so even how you do the document is, is the output is different. Okay. And they do it very well. Both of them do it very well. I can say that. Mm -hmm. But it, it is the, it's very manual, very labor intensive. Uh, and uh, it, it's a source of multiple issues. Um, you go to recruit somebody in there, and uh, and then they, they they get in here and they say, "Well, I didn't I didn't go to engineering school to be a writer forever, you know." And that's where they spend a lot of time. Uh, so something like this, maybe we can get some people that really spend more of the time on this side of it, which is where they thought they were going to get into in the first place, right? I think this is how we can start to change things. I really do. It's, it's when you start to really apply some of these concepts and you have a, a pilot project. I actually picked this one on purpose. And the reason I picked it was the customer already wants some changes. We already have a mandate to get the procedures together and they're beating us around the head and shoulders for not being there done already. It's a pressure cooker and we can't hire enough people, especially Pantech for this job. Quite frankly, uh, one of the reasons is it's all in engineering. So, so engineering has the responsibility to do this. Okay, and so, and, and, and quite frankly, it's a very important, highly visible thing. So, so I felt like all the stars were in alignment to try and focus on a key high-profile pilot that engineering owns to do anyway. And so that's why I, I, I picked this. And so far I've gotten some pretty good response. So I, I feel that confident that that's going to come out. This one, I'm, I'm shoehorning us in, but I think I can get that on the screen. Okay? Have you talked about the implants on his experience? I've not. study from that. The transition from work stream. Like you have a lot of okay. valuable knowledge. You guys know everybody far better than I do. Please email me or call me or something if you see anything with any of these that I don't know about and connect with. Okay. Where I'm headed, I'll, I'll tell you right now, where I'm headed right now is that there's getting Kevin Kimball on board, Bill Zolliger on board, and Gil Osando on board uh, at, at, at that level, and then getting some other. Uh, subject matter experience, but if you know somebody that sent something to sign. Jim, Jim ran the process of doing a couple of streams in the SAP for workflow. Okay. And linking with the quality database and all the other databases that we have link with, he might be a good value of resource when you talk to him. Good. Good. Well, one of the things I, I'm, I'm going to be, it's going to be really interesting to do, is start to build that requirements database. Because I have a feeling Whatever requirements we have are embedded in the documents in people's heads. And the software. Exactly. And so there's going to be a big challenge to start to build that and elicit that from their heads and get it into something electronic that you can then manage at that level. And I heard a very good uh, phrase from somebody the other day, and I'll repeat here, and, 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 and I think I thought it was very apropos. Um, a requirement should not be subjective. Okay. So if you have a requirement and you look at it and it seems subjective, you know, I can trip it this way, I can trip it that way, it is not yet a requirement. Any other questions or thoughts or help on that? So how much time is an individual expected to spend on each of these projects? Is it full time? That's a good question. We, we did this other project, we took about six months. We had uh, three students, and what? How much time would you say you spent on it? No more than twenty-five percent, I believe. But I mean, sometimes less. You know, it just depends. Right, right. No more than ten hours a week. Yeah, I think this will be a little bigger project. I think I'll have some people with a little more time, as well as students in the class on this. But I would suspect it's something like that. Uh, if you participate, we wouldn't. We don't want to take away from your real job, <laughs> so to speak. But we want it to be meaningful enough to you that you're learning how to apply this and you're helping people 
learn how to apply to this environment in particular, especially somebody's not even done what you're doing here. So, like, if you do this, it's all like, is is it going to be engineering based in the engineering department, or could we like deal with our SAR and our in our organization as, as one of the pilots or? Yeah, it, uh, well, so so I'm coming from the standpoint of engineering just because that it's easy for me to get sold, to be honest. Uh -huh. okay? If engineering owns it and I have the wherewithal to do it, we can do it. But that does not mean that they just have to be an engineering to participate, okay? So, but we'll have to work out how to do that with our model that we have. Uh, departments cannot give each other burden, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Uh, so we worked a deal where the manager had to be able to cover that if it's a burden charge. But we are going to look and see if we can get some direct work. We're going to see if we can put the store together and then see if there's some direct uh, sources for this. Okay. Which then helps the, the charger situation. Right? It was just said, I need to shop around if I can do it. Right? Several years ago, there was a, a side effort to build a database of requirements and when I would try to feed it to the people who were at the master controls, they would say, I don't have time for this, I don't have time for this. And so I did a lot of the back end work for my area mm -hmm. that never got implemented. And it's like, is that something that, how, how do you um, work with that? Or is there some things that have already been done? Can they be reconstituted? Well, first off, we want to, I've already told uh, others I don't want to uh, recreate the wheel. If somebody's trying this, I want to get lessons learned. What were the problems? Why didn't it be accepted? Was it just, you know, it's not my job? <laughs> or, or, or whatever. I want to make sure I learn those. Uh, and I, can't, I, I guarantee you that'll be one of the issues. If somebody doesn't want to change, they're too busy, they're in the pressure cooker already, they certainly don't have time to do it. What we have right now, to be honest with you, is you're hiring as a new engineer to go into this area. You have two years to get your qualifications, okay? Part of the way we have it today is this person in the pressure cooker has to mentor you. Yeah. So, so you got these people in here doing the job in the pressure cooker, and then you have these other people coming in, and you need their time. Uh, well, they're waiting on their clearance, you know. Uh, well, you know, go read these documents, and they have no clue as to what this is. And so what typically we think happens is when they get the clearance, all of a sudden, well, I don't have time still to do this, but four months before you're about to get two years up, I'm going to go spend some time with you. So we don't think our onboarding and training process is, is where it needs to be. And so we actually have an initiative looking at that as well. Can we shorten it to a year? Can we do some things virtually? We do believe there's a lot of things that can be done unclassified. So we're off looking at uh, training and, and ways to revamp that. But until you start to release some pressure, they're going to tell you that. Okay, so that's why I think this will probably have to be a little bit of an independent team and you're going to have to draw people when you can, but you're going to have to maintain the vision saying, okay, not just get it populated, what do you do with it? You're going to have to help me with this piece. Okay. And if you talk to Joe Pat at Pantex Engineering League, They'll tell you one of the biggest things they have problems with is pushing paper around, getting everybody and the brother to approve it, and he wants something to where he can route things and, and approve things better. So I was trying to connect a couple of different things with this as well. Okay. So anyway, very exploratory early stages if you're interested in something like that. Any other thoughts or pearls of wisdom? Because I can certainly use your help. So have you considered getting getting actual people to do the work, the experts together? You know, like for instance, send you know our Becky Cable to the Pantex and see how they do the do so. I mean, we've got to try to align the processes. That's right. And, and until you actually can see somebody how somebody else is doing it, it's you know, you're going to have problems with that. But what I foresee is you now to take our experts out and send them to Pantex for a week or. You know, they're already always behind, right? like I said, it's pressure cooker, so it's there's a, there's, a, there's a problem in them getting their job done to get them, you know, aligned with the other right. side. So, and then having somebody outside, like for instance, if you took any one of us and said, okay, you go to Pantex and you go to White Wells and sit with these people, I mean, that would be beneficial, but it might, we might not have the same 
You we're not gonna, looking at it the same. I, it's going to take all those to be honest, Jay. Right. I mean, uh, we're, we're going to start off with a Kaizen event for people here, mm -hmm. Kaizen pit people here. At the same time, even if we're not doing this, the idea is to get these two together. How do you think they're going to do that unless they have that kind of right. interaction, right? So, so that's going to happen with or without this. I feel you know, very, pretty confident that we're going to do this. Um, I th that's why I think it's a perfect time to actually combine and do it, because you're going to have to have that interaction. With it. And uh, that's another reason for saying it's for choosing because engineering owns it. So if engineering has the responsibility to deliver this, they're the ones who are going to have to say that we want to do this. But I can tell you right now, they have to combine these as part of the contract, as part of what they committed to. Okay. So that, that that interaction has to. Be. Right. I mean, you know, we got some like, we got some phenomenal people, but you know I know it's going to be difficult to get them out because. Yeah, that's going to be the trick, is how do you still walk with you guys? Mm -hmm. right. Okay. So if you think of any, anything else, any other people that should be involved, uh, even if you're not involved, please let me know. Okay. And on your other one, I would probably Here? Yeah. Ben Green. Ben Green? Okay, that's it. Okay. All right, you guys are happy to need more than I hope you hear, I think. This is good. Yeah. 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 Yeah.